Okay, so I just wanted to do a final video talking a little bit more about collinearity and assessing it with the variance inflation factor. So make sure you're ready for this. Do you know what collinearity is? And do you know how collinearity impacts your results? If not, revisit the collinearity video. What, what is it? Is it bad? How do we avoid it? And the collinearity illustration where I did little simulations to illustrate how collinearity impacts the power of your results. So why do we need to assess collinearity? So if you've already done an efficiency calculation, you've searched over a bunch of designs that are most efficient and you found the ones that were most efficient. So wouldn't the most efficient design automatically have the lowest collinearity? Yes and no, it'll have the lowest collinearity among the designs you searched, but they might all have a collinearity problem. So if your interstimulus interval range, if they're all small for all of your designs, you will have the least collinear design, but you might have collinearity that's still kind of in a dangerous zone. So also, wouldn't the correlation between regressors be a way to assess collinearity? So just do a quick correlation of your regressors. Yes, but only one type of collinearity, and that's collinearity between two regressors. It might actually be, uh, the collinearity might be, re, re, uh, might be driven through a couple of regressors. So for example, if one regressor is equal to the sum of two regressors, that would be perfect collinearity. And you can see you can take more than one regressor. And I had an example like that in an earlier video with perfect collinearity. So we have a statistic, it's called the variance inflation factor. You don't need data for this. Uh, it's a little misleading, the R function for VIF, which is variance inflation factor, asks for data, it asks for model output, but you can just dump random variables in for the, or random data in for the, the data. So here's what the VIF is. It quantifies the severity of your collinearity and it can pick up when, you're, when you don't have pairwise collinearity. So if your collinearity is between sets of regressors instead of pairs of regressors. And I'm gonna go through the derivation of it just to give you this added um, intuition about what collinearity is telling you. So remember, we, when we looked at the R simulation, uh, sort of the second video, I did uh, insert uh, an extra video, but the, the simulation that looked at the power, we saw that the variance when we had collinear regressors was increased. So the variance inflation factor is looking at how much that variance inflated compared to a model without collinearity. So it compares the variance of our regressor when it's modeled with the other regressors to the variance of our regressor if it weren't modeled with other regressors. Does that make sense? So it's the ratio of these two things. Now I'm gonna put these little boxes around here because I'm about to show you an equation and I don't want you to get overwhelmed. So our goal is to have this ratio and the equation I have is the orange box equals green box times some blue box. So you can see if I divide both sides of my equation by this green box, I'll have orange over green, right? It'll be orange over green equals blue. So whatever's going in this blue box will be the VIF, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So what's in the orange box? Just the variance of beta hat j, the estimated variance of the beta with collinearity. So this is what it looks like just in the model with all of its buddies, all the other regressors. This part here, this might look really confusing. All this is is the estimated variance of the beta without collinearity. So if you just modeled xj, so j is the regressor, that we're interested in computing the collinearity in this case for. So if you modeled xj by itself, this is what its variance would look like. So it's you know, the residual variance and then the variance of the regressor and this n minus one. You can work it out on your own or just take my word for it. There is one caveat, this is assuming xj was mean centered. Then if xj is mean centered, you can do this matrix multiplication, xj transpose xj inverse times s squared that is the equation that we've seen many times for the estimated variance of a beta hat. This is the estimated variance of a beta hat if xj is all by itself in the model. You can do this, multiply it out by hand, and you'll get this. All right, and last but not least is this term, one over one minus r squared j. I have not told you what r squared j is, I'm about to, but it turns out if you multiply these two things together, 
you get the original variance and therefore the blue box, which is what we want, is the orange box divided by the green box. So what is that thing? R squared J, one over one minus R squared J, so I'm talking about this little chunk here, is the R squared from the model prediction, uh, from the model, ooh, should say predicting, and I shouldn't have used the word predicting, but you have XJ on one side and all the other regressors on the other side. So here's XJ, here are all the other regressors, and then an error term. So all you do is you run this model and you get the R squared from the model, and that's what R squared J is. Notice no data in here at all, only the regressors. So you can do this before you collect your data to make sure you're not about to make a big mistake. So intuitively this makes sense. This R squared will only be high if our regressor of interest is highly correlated with some linear combination of the other regressors. So that's good. So we want this number to be small. And it turns out the way the VIF is, it's one over one minus that number, one minus a correlation um, that will be big. All right, if this is, this is bounded between uh, zero and one, if this is really big, this will be close to zero and this will blow up. So big VIF means bad. If this is really good, if this is zero, there's no correlation between your regressor and everything else, our VIF will be uh, one. And there are very various values you can take. Anyway, okay, here are the rules for VIF. So first of all, there's, I'm gonna show you in a second, the R library has, a, R has a library called HH, which has a function called VIF. And it does ask for data, but you can just input noise if you don't have data. It isn't actually used in the calculation at all. And here are the VIF rules of thumb. Your goal is to have a VIF less than five and VIF greater than 10 is probably not great. So um, as I said earlier, sometimes I, I worked with somebody before and she was using some type of model to create the parametrically modulated values. So she had two competing models and she wanted to model the modulation values at the same time. And they were highly correlated her VIFs were sometimes over 100, which is huge. And when that happened, the maps, the activation maps for those subjects looked really weird. It was like the values were either really huge positive numbers or really small negative numbers. So um, yeah, so look at the VIF and that will tell you uh, who you're, you know, when you're in trouble. So I'm gonna show you some quick code. So this is all code we've seen before. I'm gonna load the libraries fMRI and HH. This make reg function is the function I went over before. It's um, for the stimulus response setup. So I'm gonna have two, two stimuli, a stimulus, <laughs> stimulus, and then very shortly after that, there's always a response. So this is the same setting I've used for all of these uh, collinearity and orthogonalization videos. So if you haven't watched them, this may not, not be as common. So it's just a, it's a design where there's a stimulus and then a feedback um, cue. And if those are very close to each other, you're gonna have collinearity. If you space them out, you won't. So this just makes the regressors. I'm not gonna go through that code again. And here I'm creating um, a highly collinear case. So the stimulus onsets occur every 15 seconds then the response onsets occur a half a second after each stimulus onset. So I'm gonna plot them. Hopefully, yep, so you can see they're almost on top of each other. And I said the VIF function, it requires a linear regression output and the linear regression requires some data. So I put fake data in here. I just uh, simulated some normal draws and then compute the VIF. So you just feed in the regression into the VIF function. And there it is, really high, 22. So this would be something I'd be worried about. So, and just to uh, show you, it doesn't matter that those data were random. If I run it a couple of times, it's always gonna be exactly the same because the Y fake data, it's not used in the calculation. All right, if we separate these by two seconds instead, much better. Now our VIF is far below our cutoff of five. And of course these are, these are just rules of thumb. Um, if you break the rule by a little bit, you know, it might be fine. 
it's, it's just going to kill your power, as we saw before. All right. So what if your VIF is high and it's too late? Just proceed with caution. If this is a, a design matrix that's varying by subjects, so like this example I told you earlier, where some type of model was fit to each subject's behavioral data to create modulation values for that subject. Um, so some subjects might have really high VIF and some might be fine. I would just keep my eye on those subjects with a high VIF and look at their maps, look at their activation maps and see if they range from really huge positive values to really small negative values. And that will um, tell you that subject's going to act like an outlier in your group model. So I would remove them. Um, right. But your type one error is preserved, but that's on average. So as I just said, this one outlier could, or a couple of outliers can kind of ruin things. So you have to be careful. I would probably just chuck the subjects that had a really high VIF um, because it's, it's a perfectly reasonable reason to remove a subject from analysis. And actually, when, when you do have a VIF, rethink what you're doing. Do you really need these two highly collinear regressors if they're that similar? they're probably not doing very different things. And um, due to how collinearity works and variability is shared between regressors, we often get into this place where we wanna say one regressor explains more than another. And we really can't do that because sometimes regressors work together and do various things. And maybe, you know what, maybe I'll do a video on that. Um, it, it'll just be a, a hand wavy kind of analogy with Venn diagrams to illustrate my point. But you have to be careful when you're um, trying to make these really kind of complicated interpretations from your model. You want to say one is better than the other. We often can't do that. So stay tuned for that. Maybe it will be the next video. So thanks very much and I hope you have a really good day.